Dr. Dan, it is an incredible honor to have the opportunity to learn from you and the research that you've done over your entire career around autophagy. Can you tell us a little bit about what first got you interested in autophagy? So basically I started, um, uh, got my PhD at Penn State University and I sort of was interested in there in that in autophagy then a little bit but we weren't really doing anything like that. Um, did a postdoc at Albert Einstein and then moved to Johns Hopkins. But anyhow when I was at Hopkins we started, I had to find a different direction to get away from the lab I was in so I decided we we're going to go do autophagy because at that time, autophagy needed a, um, an, a different angle. Everything that was looked at in autophagy was biochemistry, and I decided to go to the cell biology part. Okay, so tell us a little bit, sort of like in a nutshell, what is autophagy? And we're going to talk more about this later, but the Nobel Prize in Medicine was, was won just in 2016 for autophagy. So how many years ago, roughly, did you, did you first get interested in autophagy and then define it? For I got interested in autophagy over 30 years ago. Wow. No. Um, it was defined by Christian de Duve back in the 60s, 1960s and such. Um, and he identified it based on morphology, just looking at the cells by electron microscopy. And he actually was able to see these vacuoles, which were unusual. Mm -hmm. And Christian de Duve, who won the Nobel Prize also, by identifying lysosomes wow. uh, and some other organelles, but predominantly lysosomes. And he did this by a variety of me me methods, but the first method, one of the best methods was electron microscopy where you could actually visually see the cell and look what's in the cell. So he found these unusual structures, very unusual structures that were membrane bound that were within the cell. And these structures had cell components in there. So he came up with the, the idea of autophagy or self-eating. Yes. So the cell was actually eating itself. It was grabbing itself, its, its organelles, its cytoplasm, parts of itself, and putting them into vacuoles, which would then end up in the lysosomes. So if I were to sort of, sort of give an analogy almost, within the house, which is like the cell, right? So if we're in our house, the autophagy is, is essentially cleaning out, cleaning, doing the housekeeping within the house so that the house sparkles and is looking beautiful and ultimately for the cell, it's, it's, it's in its most healthy form. How would you sort of, what analogy would you give us? So basically, I mean, when, um, when it was first examined by Duduv, he just thought it was pathology. He really, really thought there was something wrong going on the cell, the cell, this is not a normal process. This cleansing. A, this cleansing or this uh, self-eating. Self-eating. And you can see, I mean, you can understand, if you, why would the cell want to eat itself? Right. Yeah, so they, at that time, they thought there was something going on. And then when Mortimer came up on board, and that's, that, was the, that was the person that really got me into the field, he realized that this process was activated when the cells were starved of amino acids. So he put two and two together, then indeed when the amino acids were low in the cell, the cell then was eating itself to provide the cell with amino acids. So he considered this self, he considered this process of autophagy more of a essential for cell survival, so that the cells can survive various stresses, nutrient stresses, right, and such. Then it got more interesting more and more years later. But anyhow, at that point in time, that's when I got interested in it as to what was going on. It needed the cell biology approach, and I started uh, working on it at Hopkins, and ever since after I left Hopkins, I've been at the University of Florida, which has really been better beneficial to me because back then when I first started it, the best way of examining and looking at autophagy was by electron microscopy. Mm. Um, that's a big microscopes, high, high resolution microscopes basically, which, not, which only usually anatomy cell biology departments have. Hmm. First it started with cancer. So it became interested in cancer. So cancer, there was two basically fields of thought. One was the cancer cells shut down autophagy. And that will allow the cells to grow more because they want, they're not degrading themselves. So they can build and grow faster and, you know, and the divide more. The cells or the cancer cells? The, the cancer cells. Got it. The cancer cells. So one thread of thought was the fact that with the cancer cells, 
uh, the fact that they grow so well is they don't degrade, they don't eat themselves. Mm -hmm. So they grow real well. Mm -hmm. The other crane of thought was the fact that the autophagy protects the cells. So there were two things that were actually going on. And actually both of those things are actually true now as well, depending upon the different cancers. When they were looking at the cancers, and they were looking at the chemotherapy agents, the effects of chemotherapy on the cancers, and they were seeing that some of these cancers were more resistant to the chemotherapy. So they started looking at, well, maybe it's the autophagy that's actually being activated to protect the cell. So with the LC3 marker, yes, they were seeing the autophagy actually turning on. To and protect the to cell. To protect the cell. Mm -hmm. So at that time, there were, some, there were a number of inhibitors that were out there. None of them that were very specific, but there were a number of inhibitors out there. So these were compounds that were used routinely. So when they added these compounds in the presence of the chemotherapy agents, the cells were dying faster. That's because you shut down the cell protection by shutting down the autophagy. And that sort of really got people really interested in looking at ways of inhibiting autophagy. What is your dream of, of where this work, your life's work, will go over the next decade. I'm hoping that we can regulate autophagy in such a way that we can cure some of the diseases or basically uh, make, make the, the cells healthier, mm -hmm. to avoid the cancers, to avoid the pathogens that we basically are basically exposed to and such like that. Uh, possibly we're getting back to aging again, mm -hmm. uh, really to make the cells healthier for longer periods of time and such. But that's a little tricky because you really want, at times you want to turn it off, but other times you want to turn it on. For aging, you sort of want to turn it on. You know, you, you really want to basically help the cell or tell the cell uh, that you really want to get rid of the old organelles and such like that. Under the in, in older cells, mm -hmm. the cells, the autophagy um, pathway is a little bit reduced. It's not as efficient. Right. So the idea is to activate it and turn it on. Now, during normal growth of the tumor, when the blood supply has yet to come in, the tumors are turning on autophagy to survive. So you would actually want to shut down autophagy at that particular time as well before the blood supply gets to the tumor. So different conditions, you want to turn off autophagy. Other conditions, you want to turn on autophagy. So there's a big area now of looking at the role of autophagy in metastasis of the tumors, not only inhibiting the tumors, but also in the metastasis of the tumors. So again, when, you're, yeah, when you wake up in the morning, you haven't eaten in a while, autophagy's kicked in. That's because your amino acid levels in the bloodstream are low. Right, and for example, I'm intermittent fasting this morning, so I'm not, I won't be eating probably until sometime later on this afternoon. And I know that the intermittent fasting is also helping to activate the autophagy in my body. And because my body is, is I hope, you know, healthy, I'm getting that anti-aging, youth-activating cellular effect? Yes, basically you're right. So sometimes it, in the intermittent fasting is sometimes easier for some people than other people. Right. You're really pretty much starving when you wake up. You're really right. hungry when you wake up. But once you get past 9 or 10 o'clock, then it sort of seems to be okay. But you have to be engaged in something so you're really not even thinking about Boy, I'm hungry right now. <laughs> and you're and you're intermittent fasting specifically to activate your autophagy? Yeah. Yeah, mine is specifically to go after the autophagy. Yeah. Mostly with the heart and stuff like that. Tell really. us a little bit about the heart. Well the heart the heart, like I said, those those cells are not dividing. Mm -hmm. And basically with the heart, um, which beats all the time and requires a lot of ATP. Um, the mitochondria age relatively quickly compared to other cell types that don't require the, as much ATP as the heart does. So you really have to have a good functional um, autophagy pathway or a way of keeping it turned on to get rid of the damaged mitochondria or to get rid of the damaged organelles in the heart. So that's sort of one of the reasons I'm, I'm more interested in it is really to um, give me a, a better or healthier heart. Fascinating. So heart health, liver health, any of the organs or any parts of our body where the cells are not dividing, those are the organs or the cells that we really need to 
take the best care of and, and activate the autophagy in those types of cells. Correct. The kidney was actually the most active in looking at it, in, in turning on autophagy. Mm. And um, very few people are actually studying the role of, of autophagy in the kidney function and such, but it was, it was looked at as being one of the most active organs uh, turning on autophagy. If you could sort of wave your magic wand and have an area of focus around autophagy and disease prevention where the researchers really put their, their attention there, where would you want the scientists to be, to be working? Mine would be more cancer. And basically I would think, you know, the cancer I would pick would be the, the bone cancers, mm -hmm. the osteosarcomas right now. The reason I'm keen on osteosarcomas is because that hits a lot of the younger people, mm. the kids and such. Mm -hmm. You know, I would love to see more focus on that. Aging, yeah, I don't know about aging. <laughs> aging is going to happen, <laughs> unfortunately. I'm not sure how well you could slow it down. Um, not sure. <laughs> Dr. Dunn, mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. so fascinating to, to learn from you and the work that you've done over the past 30 years is such an important mm -hmm. work and it's a, it is, it's a true honor to be able to sit and um, have this conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks for asking me.